very simple illustration. And these illustrations assumed that per capita CO2 emissions would remain constant over time. Okay, the level of per capita CO2 emissions would remain constant over time at the levels that prevailed around the year 2000. But on that highly simple assumption, and these are purely illustrative calculations, these calculations show, using the United Nations population projections, that projected population growth in South Central Asia, that is essentially India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, over the first 50 years of the current century, will increase global CO2 emissions by about 931 million tons. Okay, so we're holding per capita emissions constant in that region, simply taking the demographic projection of the United Nations, which of course may be more or less uh, right, it depends, or more or less wrong. But that simple illustrative calculation suggests that population growth of almost a billion people in that world region will increase global CO2 emissions by about 931 million tons. The more people, the more fossil fuel use, the more carbon. However, projected population growth in North America, and here we're just talking about Canada and the United States, over that 50-year period is put at about 120 million people. But holding per capita emissions constant in North America, of course, that relatively small demographic increase has a huge uh, effect in terms of carbon. Uh, indeed, the corresponding increase in carbon is 2.5 billion tons. So the effects of population, of course, depend upon the context within which they occur. Okay, Gordana? So, this brings me to the conclusion, and the conclusion is that, <laughs> think what you will, population matters. That's my main conclusion. In many ways, this transition, you've got to know about this transition. In many ways, the demographic transition has been a good thing. No doubt about it, and it benefits people everywhere uh, in many ways. But the transition also essentially represents a period of considerable destabilization in human history. That's what the transition is. It's a period essentially of destabilization because the death rate declines and the birth rate declines later. And this destabilization occurs both at the national level, but it also occurs at the level of individuals, at the level of individual couples, individual men and women, at the household, the family level. In this context, in my view, the provision of safe, effective, and affordable contraception is the main way of minimizing this destabilization. Because contraception, if people really have access to contraception, and Steve Sinding will no doubt tell you about the, those people who don't, but contraception affords people at least with choice. And in my view, all the evidence is that Given the possibility of making that choice, given the possibility of using contraception, then eventually, everywhere, uh, men and women decide to take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you have drawn your own conclusion quite clearly, Professor Dyson. And therefore, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michel Guerin, who will uh, bring us to a few questions that need to be asked. In fact, uh, while Gordana is uh, placing the PowerPoint, I see it already, um, here you see his presentation, a brief discussion around seven questions. Mr. Guerin, the floor is yours. First, thank you very much for inviting me to come here today and to be able to speak to you. Um, I've, I'm going to say basically the same things as the, what the team just said, but in a different ways and trying to stimulate a discussion I will raise a number of questions. Uh, I'm affiliated with the French Institute for Research and Development and also I'm currently working at the Pasteur Institute in the Emerging Disease Unit. Most of my work has been in Africa primarily in small scale uh, type of uh, research in a, what was called population laboratory where you sit down in a village for 10 years and study everything you can 
but have uh, had lately uh, broader interest in what, what's going on in Africa. And Africa is like uh, Asia uh, 50 years ago, uh, is undergoing a major demographic transition uh, much faster than I would have anticipated when I started studying demography, and much faster also than uh, most people I know uh, have been anticipating. Uh, so Tim gave us a very good uh, an excellent uh, uh, review of the demographic transition, and I think I have nothing to add or subtract. It's very uh, comprehensive. As you know, it's a very complex topic, which has been the focus of uh, endless discussions. And there's been a, a number of, of uh, journal articles uh, on this topic, uh, people arguing for and against, by many of my colleagues. So rather than trying to give you one more account on this, uh, I will try to uh, raise a number of questions. Uh, those views are very personal and at times provocative, and they are meant to be provocative in order to stimulate the, the discussion. Uh, as we have seen in Tim's presentation, Thank you. Um, the demographic transition is a very complex process which encompasses, in fact, several transitions, the health transition, the fertility transition, the marriage transition, economic growth, urbanization, and many other consequences of those major changes uh, that uh, uh, are around this uh, demographic transition. There's even now a second demographic transition going on uh, uh, as uh, uh, labeled by uh, my Dutch and Flemish colleagues, Dirk van der Kaar and uh, Ron Lestag. Ron Lestag was in Paris two weeks ago and gave a lecture on the second demographic transition where you get very, very low fertility and very late uh, marriage. Um, all these processes uh, are very well documented and uh, we are now facing new issues and new options for uh, solving those problems. Uh, Next slide, yeah. Uh, so the framework, the, the seven questions that I would like to uh, raise here are, are the following. Um, trying to go back really uh, a long time back in time, in terms of reproductive success, what is so different with humans? Was Malthus right or wrong? I mean, you know, Malthus is always the center of all the debates on the, around the demographic transition. Is the Dutch case replicable? And I will explain why um, we'll focus on the Dutch case as well. What happens beyond food limits? Are North-South relationships changing? Um, are we talking about fertility control or are we talking about reproductive health? And is negative population growth desirable? So let's go on the, the first uh, uh, question. As you know, living organisms have a common strategy to maximize their reproduction. For anim in animal populations, more resources or more opportunities tend to produce more offspring most often associated with the population explosion. And population growth is always limited by natural situations. The limits may come from food availability, from change in the environment, from disease, or from predators, which put a halt on the population explosion. Next slide. Uh, here is the most classic uh, uh, scheme that people have been using, uh, introduced by uh, uh, Dive, who was a zoologist and an ecologist more than a demographer. As you see, uh, there have been three main phases uh, in human history, uh, which are uh, in three different colors, the Paleolithic, the Neolithic, and the uh, recent uh, uh, rise in population, which is the core of the demographic transition. What is important here is that every time you have a population explosion and then you tend to reach a limit, uh, you, uh, the population tends to stabilize. And 